Welcome to worship at Zion today. It's good that we can be together. We can hear God's word. We can be together to pray, to, uh, to live the life. Um, a few announcements that I would like to bring to your attention at this time. <clears throat> Excuse me. I received a note that uh, Ed Rudd, Sonny Rudd, passed away on Wednesday evening at the Amory Hospital, uh, and his funeral will be at the Lutheran Church up in Luck on July 8th at 10 o'clock in the morning. So um, if you know uh, Ed, even if you don't, you know we can keep his family in our prayers. Um, today is big, big anniversary day for Duane and Judy Wienendahl. Holy smokes, 40 years. They got married. <laughs> <laughs> they got married when they were nine years old <laughs> and it's just amazing that they look as good as they do and they're 49 <laughs> plus um, uh, as we as we go through our service today uh, during our prayers we will be re be remembering the community of Charleston, South Carolina. Um, terrible tragedy there uh, with the, the death of good people uh, and uh, no sense to it whatsoever. Um, two of the pastors who died in that uh, were actually educated at uh, ELCA seminaries and, um, and, and the gunman was actually a member of an ELCA congregation in Charleston. So it really, it hits home, you know, that tragedy can come out of, of good things in life. So um, a prayer that our presiding bishop, ELCA presiding bishop, Elizabeth Eaton, uh, has written. I'll be sharing that during our prayers toward the close of our service. But we certainly pray that uh, love will unite and prevail and that hatred will die away. Um, as we live in love, we will, we will change the world. We uh, are looking at um, needs in our own community. The uh, Grace Place donations are still being received. There's a table out by the offices. We've taken up uh, some already, and, um, and the church did share a gift of $4,000 with Grace Place and uh, just to be used wherever they need it. Um, that's a good place. And people who have had, uh, you know, not good times in life are learning to live and they're learning job skills and many homeless children um, pray for the children that they will, that they will learn, um, you know, from their experiences at Grace Place as well. As we uh, fellowship with one another, coffee servers are needed in the month of July. The sign-up list is on the door into the fellowship hall. Take a moment to check that out. If you're wondering what Feel the Heat and Hit the Road are, as you're looking through your announcements, um, Feel the Heat is in reference to our dead boiler down in the basement. And so um, we do have a bid on that and we'll, we'll be sending out a letter with some more information. And uh, the congregation has accepted that. Hit the road, that's our street project and parking lot project. And so we're hoping to get more answers and more better timeline on all of that as time goes by here, uh, hopefully fairly soon. Um, but but um, that's a suggestion for uh, coffee hour donations, if anyone would like to do that. We continue our worship now uh, as we sing our opening hymn, hymn number 632, O God, our help in ages past.
We continue in the front portion of our hymnal on page 97 as we give thanks for the gift of holy baptism. Blessed be the Holy Trinity, one God, the fountain of living water, the rock who gave us birth, our light, and our salvation. Amen. Joined to Christ in the waters of baptism, we are clothed with God's mercy and forgiveness. Let us give thanks for the gift of baptism. Please join me as we pray. We give you thanks, O God, for in the beginning your spirit moved over the waters, and by your word you created the world, calling forth life in which you took delight. Through the waters of the flood you delivered Noah and his family. Through the sea you led your people Israel from slavery into freedom, at the river, your son was baptized by John and anointed with the Holy Spirit. By water and your word, you claim us as daughters and sons, making us heirs of your promise and servants of all. We praise you for the gift of water that sustains life. And above all, we praise you for the gift of new life in Jesus Christ. Shower us with your spirit and renew our lives with your forgiveness, grace, and love. To you be given honor and praise through Jesus Christ our Lord in the unity of the Holy Spirit, now and forever. Amen. The grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, the love of God, and the communion of the Holy Spirit be with you all. In peace, let us pray to the Lord. Lord, have mercy. For the peace from above and for our salvation, let us pray to the Lord. Lord, have mercy. 
for the peace of the whole world, for the well-being of the Church of God, and for the unity of all, let us pray to the Lord. Lord, have mercy for this holy house and for all who offer here their worship and praise. Let us pray to the Lord. Lord, have mercy. Help, save, comfort, and defend us, gracious Lord. Amen. Amen. Glory to God in the highest and peace to God's people on earth. Lord God, heavenly King, almighty God and Father, we worship you, we give you thanks, we praise you for your glory. Lord Jesus Christ, only Son of the Father, Lord God, Lamb of God, you take away the sin of the world. Have mercy on us. You are seated at the right hand of the Father. Receive our prayer. For you alone are the Holy One. You alone are the Lord. You alone are the Most High. Jesus Christ, with the Holy Spirit, in the glory of God the Father. Amen. Glory to God in the highest, and peace to God's people on earth. Our prayer of the day is printed in the worship folder. Would you please join me as we pray? Almighty and merciful God, we implore you to hear the prayers of your people. Be our strong defense against all harm and danger, that we may live and grow in faith and hope through Jesus Christ, our Savior and Lord. Amen. Good morning. The first lesson is from the book of Lamentations, chapter 3, verses 22 to 33. Because of the Lord's great love, we are not consumed, for his compassions never fail. They are new every morning. Great is your faithfulness. I say to myself, the Lord is my portion, therefore I will wait for him. The Lord is good to those whose hope is in him, to the one who seeks him. It is good to wait quietly for the salvation of the Lord. It is good for people to bear the yoke while they are young. Let them sit alone in silence, for the Lord has laid it on them. Let them bury their faces in the dust. There may yet be hope. Let them offer their cheeks to one who would strike them, and let them be filled with disgrace. For people are not cast off by the Lord forever. Though he brings grief, he will show compassion. So great is his unfailing love. For he does not willingly bring affliction or grief to any human being. The second lesson is from the book of Mark, chapter 5, verses 21 through 43. When Jesus had again crossed over by boat to the other side of the lake, a large crowd gathered around him while he was by the lake. Then one of the synagogue leaders named Jairus came, and when he saw Jesus, he fell at his feet. He pleaded earnestly with him, My little daughter is dying. 
please come and put your hands on her so that she will be healed and live. So Jesus went with him. A large crowd followed and pressed around him. And a woman was there who had been subject to bleeding for 12 years. She had suffered a great deal under the care of many doctors and had spent all she had. Yet instead of getting better, she grew worse. When she heard about Jesus, she came up behind him in the crowd and touched his cloak because she thought, if I just touch his clothes, I will be healed. Immediately, her bleeding stopped and she felt in her body that she was freed from her suffering. At once, Jesus realized that power had gone out from him. He turned around in the crowd and asked, who touched my clothes? You see the people crowding against you, his disciples answered, and yet you can ask, who touched me? But Jesus kept looking around to see who had done it. Then the woman, knowing what had happened to her, came and fell at his feet and trembled with fear, and trembling with fear, told him the whole truth. He said to her, daughter, your faith, your faith has healed you. Go in peace and be freed from your suffering. While Jesus was still speaking, some people came from the house of Jairus, the synagogue leader. Your daughter is dead, they said. Why bother the teacher anymore? Overhearing what they said, Jesus told him, don't be afraid, just believe. He did not let anyone follow him except Peter, James, and John, the brother of James. When they came to the home of the synagogue leader, Jesus saw a commotion with people crying and wailing loudly. He went in and said to them, why all this commotion and wailing? The child is not dead, but asleep. But they laughed at him. After he put them all out, he took the child's father and mother and the disciples who were with him and went in where the child was. He took her by the hand and said to her, Talitha kum, which means, little girl, I say to you, get up. Immediately, the little girl stood up and began to walk around. She was 12 years old. At this, they were completely astonished. He gave strict orders not to let anyone know about this and told them to give her something to eat. Here ends the reading. and 
Thank you so much. Uh, beautiful song. Um, Audrey de Koch. Uh, Audrey is from New Richmond and um, she is a sophomore at UW Eau Claire and uh, pursuing a career in nursing. And uh, she sings in the concert choir at Eau Claire and uh, she comes to us as friends of Paul and Vicky's and uh, we are grateful that Audrey could be with us today. So thank you very much. We take a moment to pray. We thank you, gracious Lord, for your tremendous love. It is a love that washes over all of creation. And there are times that we don't see that love in our world, and we want to make sense of it somehow. Help us always to look to you first, not to our own hearts, not to our own minds, but to look to you and to find in you peace and love and salvation and strength for the next moment, if that's all we can handle. We find it in you. It is in your life-giving name that we pray, Jesus. Amen. In today's Gospel reading from the Gospel of Mark, chapter 5, we see two stories, and they are intertwined. Mark does this he he will and none of the other gospels do not not i don't think at all uh, but he'll always put two stories together and it's like why can't we deal with one thing at a time but you know that's not life <laughs> sometimes we have to deal with more than one thing at a time and so the gospel of mark is interesting as he puts these stories Together, there's some con confusion about who Jesus should be and who touched who and what should happen when, now, I need you now, not somebody else. In these two stories, we meet some people and our hearts go out to these people big time. They are struggling with issues of living and dying and any one of us would do anything we could to relieve some of their pain, if we could. One of the first things many of us do when we meet someone who is suffering is that we want to help make sense out of the chaos, to help make sense out of the tragedy. We want to find a reason. We want to call on our faith for one thing, and then we feel that we have to say something. And I think I've heard one phrase or one like it thousands of times. God must have done this for a reason. Right? Our Lutheran heritage began back in the 1500s. That's a long time ago. But there were some key phrases that came up during those reforming years that have helped to define Lutheranism ever since. One of them is sola scriptura. That means scripture alone. Solo, scripture, scripture alone. Another one is sola fide, faith alone. Today we're going to look at where God's word, the scripture, where God's word leads us 
in that terrible quest for searching for God's will in the presence of bad things that sometimes happen in our lives. In the reading from Mark's Gospel, we meet a man whose daughter is dying. As soon as we meet him, a woman who has been ill and seeking medical help for 12 years appears on the scene. Then shortly thereafter, Jesus rejoins the man and we find out, we think, in that short amount of time, this man's daughter has died. In both situations, Jesus brings healing. And as we read the Gospels, we are not surprised to uh, see this healing touch of Jesus because it happens many, many times in the Gospels. In Mark chapter 8, we read the story of Jesus restoring sight to the blind man at Bethsaida. In John chapter 9, restoring sight to a blind man in Jerusalem, different place, different person. In John chapter 11, the raising of Lazarus at Bethany. In Matthew chapter 8 and Mark chapter 5 and Luke chapter 8, this is all the same story told by three different gospel writers, the curing of the demon-possessed man, Legion, in the land of the Gadarenes, or the Gerasenes, it's sometimes called. Here in Mark chapter 5 and Matthew chapter 9 and Luke chapter 8, again the same story retold in three different Gospels is the raising of Jairus' daughter in Capernaum. In John chapter 5, there is the healing of the invalid at the Bethesda pool. And I found 20 other healing stories, separate stories, some of them told multiple times in other Gospels, throughout the Gospels. I may have missed some, you know what I'm saying? But there are, if you thought my list was getting a little long, just keep going. <laughs> uh, different people, different villages, different situations. We are used to seeing Jesus heal those who have a variety of maladies. I'm sure we have all prayed for someone who is ill. I'm sure we have. When they are healed, we are grateful. When they are healed, we thank God. When they are healed, we thank the doctors, we thank the nurses, we thank the other medical helpers and healers. But sometimes we pray, you know, and it doesn't go at all the way we hope. It just doesn't. And sometimes people wonder where God is then. Where is God in all of this? In those times we want to make sense of it all, perhaps then one might say, well, God must have a plan, a reason for doing this, implying that the crisis is somehow at the hands of God, perhaps to teach a lesson, even a good lesson, we can say. This is what I sometimes call made-up religion. Made-up religion. We say things that sometimes we say things that sound religious, but we are always challenged to find what God's Word really says. Sola Scriptura, Scripture alone. Don't just make up stuff. Read the Bible. <laughs> Jesus resoundingly rejects this whole idea. In John chapter 9, people are trying to figure out why a man was born blind. There are people who want to make sense out of this tragedy, and there has to be a reason. And so they said, well, maybe he did something wrong. Well, they didn't know. Maybe his mom and dad did something wrong, and God is just trying to teach him a lesson. I don't, you know, that's what some people were saying trying to make sense of a bad situation, Jesus said, no, 
No. The very same answer is given in the story of Job. In the Old Testament, the book of Job, we uh, see Job's friends. They are certain. They, they assume that Job is going through all of these difficult times in, in his own life, in his family's life, because he did something wrong. Job, you must have done something that God is trying to teach you a lesson. God says, no. Today's Old Testament reading from Lamentations deals with a similar kind of bad fortune. The word lamentation simply means to lament, to cry, to despair. The people of Israel had just lost their nation. Jerusalem, the beautiful, holy city, was left in ruins. People lying dead in the streets. The book of Lamentations is horrible. And the temple had been leveled to the ground. And when the temple was gone, they felt that God was just too far away. How could God do this? Let this happen. But in Lamentations chapter 3, fairly early in the lament, people are forced to deal with their pain and they recall what they knew about God. What do you know about God is maybe what somebody said. And they said, God does not willingly bring affliction or grief to any human being. Lamentations 3.33. God does not willingly bring affliction or grief to any human being. It is not God's will. Neither does it say that God will not bring a grief or affliction to those who love him. Neither does it say God will not bring grief or affliction to those who are faithful or have all the right religious answers. The word is simple. God will not do this to anyone. No one at all. Not any human being that is not the way God does things. That's what God's Word says. Made up religion, usually unfamiliar with God's Word. It's easy to make up religion if you haven't read the Bible. There's a lot of that. Unfamiliar with God's Word usually says, well, God must have a reason for doing this. Now, if you've said that, I'm not, I'm not kicking you. You know what I'm saying? Um, and I don't want you to kick yourself, but I would suggest read God's Word instead of making up things. God's Word is clear. God does not do these kind of things. Not for a reason, not for lack of a reason. Instead, here's a huge turnaround. And I am amazed at the people of Lamentations suffering as terribly as every single one of them was. No one in the city escaped that. A huge city, all despair. Instead, the lamenters are talking about God's love in verse 22. They remember that it's a love that never fails. They remember that it is a love that is renewed every morning, verse 23. A love that leads to salvation, verse 26. Here we encounter the power of love in Jesus' healing touch in the Gospel of Mark. This is a love that leads to healing and peace and life, new life. During Jesus' day, there was a teaching of the uh, Jewish rabbis that the raising of the dead would be a certain sign of the presence of the long-awaited Messiah. They were waiting for God's Messiah. And there was one sign they were looking for, and that was the resurrection of the dead. Here they got it. 
The people were waiting for the Messiah. They were waiting for their Savior. And this story sets out with the question of healing earthly illness when you and I are sick. We meet two people beset with earthly illness in this gospel reading. In Mark chapter 5, verse 26, we are told that this woman had been suffering for many years and had pursued the very best medical care that she could find. But it could not meet her need. We don't know about Jairus' daughter, this little girl, if this was a sudden onset of illness for her, if she had some health condition. Uh, we don't know that. But in both situations, we are led to believe that there is something very, very special about Jesus. The people are amazed, we are told. He is so Messiah-like. He's just like a Messiah. Amazing things do not necessarily point toward God, but the resurrection of the dead certainly does. The care Jesus gives is not merely a matter of extending this world's earthly life by a day or a year or a decade. The power of the new life from Jesus is the gift of salvation, and that is for eternity. It's a gift of new life. Something came up in our Wednesday morning Bible study. I am so grateful for that Wednesday morning Bible study. If you know, if any of you are free, Wednesday morning, 9 to 1030, it's an amazing, amazing place to be. Um, I, I learn so much from the people who are there. It was pointed out that there are two different perspectives in this gospel reading. I don't remember who said it, but I, I wrote it down. <laughs> it's like, wow, I've never seen that before or thought of it. In one perspective, the woman willfully reaches out to Jesus. She is just like anything. She reaches out with her own hand. Have you been there in times of your own life? when you willfully reached out to God. Maybe it was a desperate time. Maybe it was a hopeless time for you. Maybe it was a painful time, a time you had tried everything you could think of. And finally, with nowhere else to go, you reached out to God. And even though things may be very different now than they were then, you have walked in that woman's shoes. You know what she was feeling. You have walked in the shoes of Job. You have walked in the sh shoes, though you've walked the way of lamentation. In all of this, hopefully you have heard a true word from God. God did not punish you. God did not hurt you in order to teach you something. God loved you through all of it, led through it by the love of God into a better place. So you reached out to God. The other perspective we see in this gospel reading, there may have been other times when you could not reach out to God. There was just nothing in you that could reach out to God. Kind of like Jairus' little girl. She couldn't pray anymore. There was nothing in her that could do that. Maybe you had nothing that you could reach out to God either. But note in that time that Jesus came to her. He didn't just wait on the sidelines and say, come on, little girl, what you going to say? I'm waiting. Magic words, please. God does not work like that. He does come to us, even when we cannot come to him. 
When you don't know how to reach out to God, Jesus comes to you and then maybe it's one touch. And you have a new life. In Mark 5, 34, Jesus tells us to go in peace. Then, be free. And in Mark 5, 36, Jesus says quite simply, do not be afraid. Just believe. So, when all else falls short, just believe. But Jesus wants to challenge us with another scriptural truth. Before all else fails, <laughs> just believe. Not just after it has all gone to the dogs, right? Before anything fails, just believe. In yesterday's or today's failures, just believe. In today's or tomorrow's successes, just believe. As you go to work, as you go to sleep, as you drink your morning coffee, just believe. As you tuck your child into bed, as you play your sports, as you travel from one destination to another, just believe. As you nurture your faith, as you pray, as you worship, as you read God's word, just believe. Some things in life are not going to make sense. Sometimes we seek out Jesus in the midst of the struggle and sometimes Jesus just comes to us. Either way, the purpose of our coming together with Christ is to live the new life. We see that in today's Bible readings. May we see it in our own lives as well. Amen. Hymn number 764, Have No Fear, Little Flock.
the Holy Catholic Church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and the life everlasting. Amen. We ask our ushers to wait upon us as we share our offer. of intercession as uh, will thousands and thousands of uh, Christians in our country for uh, families in uh, Charleston, South Carolina. We continue as we pray. Oh God, you made us in your own image and redeemed us through Jesus, your son. Look with compassion on the whole human family. Take away the arrogance of hatred that infect our hearts, break down the walls that separate us, unite us in bonds of love, and through our struggle and confusion work to accomplish your purposes on earth so that in your good time every people and nation may serve you in harmony around your heavenly throne. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. Holy One, you do not distance yourself from the pain of your people, but in Jesus you bear that pain with all who suffer at others' hands. With your cleansing love, bring healing and strength to the people of Emmanuel African Methodist Episcopal Church of Charleston, South Carolina. And by your justice, lift them up, that in body, mind, and spirit they may again rejoice. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. Out of darkness, we cry to you, O God. Enable us to find in Christ the faith to trust your care, even in the midst of pain. Assure us that we do not walk alone through the valley of the shadow but that your light is leading us into life. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. O oh God, where hearts are fearful and constricted, grant courage and hope. Where anxiety is infectious and widening, grant peace and reassurance. 
where impossibilities close every door and window, grant imagination and resistance, where distrust twists our thinking, grant healing and illumination, where spirits are daunted and weakened, grant soaring wings and strengthened dreams. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. For the families who grieve loss of loved ones who have been murdered in this senseless tragedy in Charleston, South Carolina, we pray rest eternal. Grant these saints, O God, as they now rest in you. We await the day when this world will know of your great shalom and all your saints will be gathered with you. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. We thank you, gracious Lord, for the many blessings that you have poured out upon us as a family of faith, as a community, as a church, and we ask that you would continue to bless us and lead us, and that as we sense your leading, we will go where you lead the way. We thank you for the joy of gathering and worship. We thank you for the support of brothers and sisters in Christ, that even if we come here, in brokenness that we might find strength and healing. We ask that you would bless the family of Sonny Rudd who passed away this last week and uh, support them in their time of grief. We ask that you would encourage us all, whatever comes our way in life, that we would trust you and that we would look to you first and foremost. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. And we offer the prayer that our Lord taught us, our Father who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever and ever. Amen. I will exalt you, O Lord, because you have lifted me up and have not let my enemies triumph over me. O oh Lord my God, I cried out to you, and you restored me to health. You brought me up, O oh Lord, from the dead. You restored my life as I was going down to the grave. Sing praise to the Lord, all you faithful. Give thanks in holy remembrance. God's wrath is short. God's favor lasts a lifetime. Weeping spends the night, but joy comes in the morning. While I felt secure, I said, I shall never be disturbed. You, Lord, with your favor made me as strong as the mountains. Then you hid your face, and I was filled with fear. I cried to you, O Lord. I pleaded with my Lord, saying, What profit is there in my blood if I go down to the pit? Will the dust praise you or declare your faithfulness? Hear, O Lord and have mercy upon me. O Lord, be my helper. You have turned my wailing into dancing. You have put off my sackcloth and clothed me with joy. Therefore my heart sings to you without ceasing. O Lord, my God, I will give you thanks forever. Amen. Would you please stand as we receive the blessing? The Lord bless you and keep you. The Lord make his face to shine on you with grace and mercy. The Lord look upon you with favor and give you his peace. In the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit, amen. We go in peace now to serve the Lord. Thanks be to God. Our closing hymn number 765, Lord of all hopefulness.
destroy be there at our waking and give us we pray your bliss in our hearts Lord at the break of 